Hello, I'm Ronnie Eldridge. Welcome to Eldridge and Company. Some professors retire in their 60s. My guest is about to become one. With a distinguished career in public affairs and a giant reputation as a Lincoln scholar, Harold Holzer is now the director of the Roosevelt House Public Policy Institute at Hunter College. And he's my guest today, and welcome. Thank you, Ronnie. Great to be here. I've always been interested in Roosevelt House. It's a fascinating place, and it's a center for some great discussions and, and exhibitions and activity, and some thought about the civic arena, right? Absolutely. It's a, a miraculous combination. I would not have unretired from the Metropolitan Museum after 90 days for any other place, I think. Because first of all, it's a historic house, right. too little known in this city. It's the place where Eleanor and Franklin lived in New York City for 35 years, from the time almost of their marriage until they left for, for the White House. And it's the place where the New Deal was born. I can saunter into the library that FDR used as his think tank uh, as governor and as president-elect and imagine the moment Frances Perkins walked in and said, uh, and he said to her, I want you to be the first woman in a presidential cabinet. And she said, Governor, only if you promise to do old age pensions as we did in New York State. Uh -huh. And he said, Francis, we'll do it. And that was this, this spot that was and the social moment security. born in that room. Isn't that in that so in addition to that, Hunter College uh, cr has created a, a public policy program for students, a human rights program for students. It's extraordinary to see and be part of the vitality in that house when kids come in to learn from our amazing roster of teachers. And we also have a, uh, a public program schedule that runs 12 months a year with uh, biographers, uh, political scientists, authors of bestsellers, uh, relevant to the human rights and public policy arena. So it's constantly stimulating, morning till night. It's and like it's my an life environment in for this historian, right? It, it is. <laughs> if I had a second to think about the history, it would be great. Perfect. <laughs> Eleanor Franklin kept the house until FDR's mother died. Uh, that I, was basically her house, and she'd get to them for a wedding present. No, she built... Two houses. Two houses. Uh, <laughs> Hunter President Jennifer Rabb, who hired me, said, it's the first new deal. I'll give you a beautiful townhouse, but I'm going to be on the other side, <laughs> and I will cut a hole in the dining room. Oh. Her theory was, or her argument was, if we have a large dinner party, we can't possibly fit it in in <laughs> one, one of the houses, one of the rooms. So as Eleanor wrote years later, she always appeared on our side of the house at the most unexpected moments. <laughs> so when Sarah died, uh, Eleanor and Franklin both put the house up for sale. And that's when the president of Hunter College in the 1940s um, said, this would be a great place, uh, a great acquisition for Hunter. And it was sold to Hunter. FDR reduced the price. You wouldn't believe what it was sold for. Tell me. $60,000 right. for a double townhouse on East 65th Street <laughs> off of Park. Pretty um, good. <laughs> but he did cut the price down from 70. And, and um, it became a social uh, hall, a gathering place for, quote, women of all backgrounds and creeds. So even then it fulfilled Eleanor's um, uh, mission. And I like to think that um, if it opened in time that our old friend Bella Abzug, who graduated from Hunter in 1942, might have been there been there at a social event or for a debate or a, a, just to study. Well, let's talk about Bella. I met Bella in 1969. And you were a baby. I was 20. Yeah. But I was a run, helping to run a, a West Side newspaper. That's Manhattan right. I Tribune. remember that. Yes. But I met you three years later when I was doing yet another story on Bella. Uh -huh. And uh, you were at the Broadway headquarters. I think you were the campaign manager. Yes, I, I was. And it was not a pretty scene. It was an old <laughs> horned hearted cafeteria. Really? I think so, yes. When I was Bella's press secretary five years later, we had an old car dealership. Uh, so what was it like working with Bella Abzug? Stimulating, uh, <laughs> exhausting. But she, I always tell people she was my graduate school. I never went to graduate school mm. for history or literature or any of the areas I was interested in. I learned everything I needed to know about, well, public policy and public relations from Bella from day one. And politics. I mean, she was a, oh, she a was, natural politician uh, and, or a political, she was a political organizer. 
She was an organizer. She, she was a debater. She was a parliamentarian of the first order. She used parliamentary devices mm -hmm. in, in... When she went to Congress. To Congress that astounded the most conservative Republicans and earned her mm -hmm. their respect. Mm -hmm. And, um, oh, she was a phenomenon. I met her when she was had something called the 17th Congressional District Peace Action Committee. It was during the Vietnam War. And it was basically her and some of her women friends from Women Strike for Peace who insisted on interviewing all the candidates for Congress and endorsing them. And one would think it was a big organization, but it really wasn't. <laughs> well, in those days, all of our little endorsement processes were taken so seriously. Yeah, yeah. Pink ballots, blue ballots. Yeah. Yeah. She first ran in 1970 for the old 19th district, right? That was Leonard Farbstein's yes, right. Lower East Side and of Village. And she beat Leonard Farbstein. Which no one else had been able to do. Right. I remember us working in campaigns from 62 on, up every With two a years. lot of good candidates. Yeah. Ted yeah. Weiss, yeah. Bill Haddad. And, but she had the shopping bags that said, Carry Bella to Congress, mm -hmm. and a great slogan, This woman's place is in the House, dot, dot, right. dot, the House of Representatives. Right. But Farbstein would come in. He never appeared, but he would, he would come in one Sunday and give out, as Bella would say, those blankety-blank white-on-white -white shirts. <laughs> Everyone in the, every man in the district got a white-on-white -white shirt oh, from Farbstein. Yeah. And she said that he's going to take this, he's going to steal the election <laughs> with a white-on-white -white shirt. Did you go to Washington with her? Occasionally. So I was on the New York staff with I see. a fabulous staff. But then I turned into the political press secretary when she ran for the Senate in 1975 and 6. So we went to Washington for big hearings. Uh -huh. She was very, still very serious about her congressional duties. Yeah. And she had subcommittees that she chaired on government secrecy. and also She was an amazing member of Congress, an amazing woman. Public works. She, we didn't talk about her hats. That was what she was famous for. She was for. famous for the hats. And supposedly on her first day on the floor, they, Fishbait Miller, the, uh, the, the doorkeeper, whatever he's called, the one who announces the president on okay. the State of the Union days, <laughs> said, Bella, you're not allowed to wear your hat on the floor. Of, and she told him what he could do with her hat, <laughs> according to myth. But she never wore it. She, she, I saw the cloakroom. She always had a hook that they left, like two hooks for the big That's great. hats. But, it was a, but even that was brilliant. Yeah. Uh, yeah. she's, because everyone recognized she knew it. her. And she, she, started knew it. Working, she started wearing a hat when she was a young lawyer because the other lawyers thought she was a secretary and assistant. Right. And it fe she felt that in court. Oh, her mother told her. Oh. Remember her mother? I remember yeah. her mother. Her mother said, Bella, if you wear a hat and gloves, they'll take you seriously. <laughs> and she said, they stopped asking me to go for coffee, but I couldn't stand the gloves. She got rid of the gloves. <laughs> well, so, Eleanor wore a hat, too. Yeah. There is a great photograph we have at Roosevelt House to tie this together. It's a photograph of a 1942 class day when Eleanor Roosevelt was speaking at the lectern at Hunter College, wearing an elaborate hat, and sitting next to her is the president of the class, Bella oh. Savitsky, wearing a beautiful suit and a hat in 1942. Uh -oh. She got it even then. That's, so I'm not sure about this lawyer yeah, story. Right. She was yeah. wearing hats. Right. I knew, you know, I met Eleanor Roosevelt really? a couple of times, and she used to wear hats sort of in the front, right? It, I, I don't know. I loved... Was she wearing the fox... Stone Martin, that it's in every I know, photograph yeah, I we love have. that, too. But she always intrigued me because her voice shook, you know, when she talked. She had a high-pitched, and I always thought she was really nervous. Now, when I look back, I don't think she was nervous. I Do think you? it was sort of a tremolo that she had. Yeah. And yet, uh, and, and of course, she also had that same patrician accent that uh, Franklin, Franklin had. Franklin yeah. And yet, what, you know, ordinary people yeah, everybody, loved her, yeah. just adored her, because yeah. they knew she was for them. Right. And uh, I, it, it's a great connection. There. She was very important to me, because I, I thought, if she's nervous, and I'm nervous, I can, maybe oh, I can, great. you know, do talk or do something. And it always struck me that that was a great thing. So Good thing you know. found out she wasn't nervous after you right. stopped being nervous. <laughs> right, that's right. <laughs> so tell me, it took me a long time to stop being nervous. Isn't that funny? Yeah. It's always good to be a little nervous. Are you ever nervous when you give a lecture no. speech? Never. Never. Right. I know. It's probably bad. So now Tony Bennett, who's a friend of mine, yeah. and also had met Eleanor, yeah. by the way, um, said once that if you don't feel nervous before you do something, then you're not really... You're not giving your full You're not effort. giving your all. Yeah. So I said, I'm sorry. My <laughs> adrenaline doesn't work that way. But yeah. it, anyway. It, anyway. So when did Lincoln come into your life? In fifth grade in Queens... When Bella got mad at me, she would always say, 
I knew it, you were nothing more than a boy from Queens. That was my, my dad. But I, I grew up in Northeast Queens, and I had an extraordinary fifth grade teacher named Henrietta Janke, and she brought in her hat one day, filled with the names of famous people from history, world history, all men. I don't remember a single woman being in the list. Folded up, and we had a grab bag, and we each picked a name. And then you became that character. I went to do research because we had a middle school library. My f best friend, Dennis Fine, whose father owned the legendary West Side Delicatessen, mm. Fine and Shapiro, mm -hmm. that's why he was my best friend, mm -hmm. among other reasons, um, he picked Genghis Khan and became a rock and roll promoter. So I think there's <laughs> something about these moments. And I picked Lincoln and literally found a book that intrigued me and uh, was off to the races. And when I had an opportunity to specialize in something, iconography and image making, which was what I was doing in politics in a way, um, I, I glommed onto it and became, as someone said, the leading specialist in Lincoln iconography because no one else was working on it, so I was always the leading expert on it, <laughs> and then expanded from there. And you've written, what, 32 books? Well, if you count the edited books, and if you count the Civil War, in addition to Lincoln, it's 52. 52. Yeah. But it's 30 years, 32 years. So when do you write these books while you're working? Well, and you're right, I've always worked. I didn't, I didn't write seriously when I worked for Bella. Uh, a few articles. But I've, you know, I've used my weekends and vacations um, to do research and to write. I've always been given grace periods at home to write. I don't know. My, my daughters who are now, I'm not allowed to say their ages, but they're much older than they were when they were little. <laughs> they gave me a pass and let me write, but I still had family time, but I'm just, I'm, I can do 12, 13, 14 hours a day on weekends of writing. Mm -hmm. Maybe not so much now, but I, I was able to do it for a long time. Right, and um, it was always interesting because you really approach Lincoln with a political point of view. Yeah. Right? Very much as a politician, yeah. and, and in my, the book I did last year as a, uh, someone who was a master of press, press relations, right. yeah, which is, people forget how um, divided and partisan, well, the country was, we know, because so blue and gray is still worse than blue and red, <laughs> right. um, and, and the journalists were openly partisan, not like today when they try to convince us that they are nonpartisan, when it's clear... Just they're the very networks. partisan. Yeah, yeah. It, all the press was like Fox and MSNBC, either or. But they let it all hang out on the news pages and the editors. How did they let each other know what they were doing? I mean, well, we didn't have television, oh. communication. How did, how did Lincoln, for instance, before he got into the White right. House, how did he, how was he able to get his message out? Well, through alliances with journalists. That was the only way. I mean, first of all, he was a, a very successful and persuasive orator, but every appearance had to be heralded in the newspaper that represented the Republican Party, say, in Illinois. So there mm -hmm. would be days of preparation, uh, days of announcements and, and marketing, so to speak. It wasn't called that. And then when he delivered his message, it would be wildly cheered by the Republican press and attacked by the Democratic press. During the Lincoln-Douglas debates, after the first debate, um, in Ottawa, Illinois. The Republican press reported that Lincoln was so successful that his supporters carried them off on his shoulders. The Democratic press, <laughs> describing the same scene, wrote Lincoln was so exhausted by his confrontation with Douglas that he had, that to, he had to be carried out <laughs> off the field. So <laughs> Which was true. Probably uh, the, 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 the supporters, yeah. 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 Although it wasn't a great debate performance that first. So one. how did he run for president? How did, how did that work then? Well, first of all, the newspapers did the campaigning. He didn't campaign. He stayed the quintessential front porch office campaign. He sent private letters to Republicans in different states to say, I expect more, I expect to do better, I don't like what I'm hearing. Um, the newspapers wrote editorials. He sometimes drafted editorials for the newspapers. Uh, he denied being a radical in private letters to the New York Times. But it was really... a uh, uh, a campaign in which the Republican Party and its journalists try to de-emphasize his anti-slavery positions, which was considered radical by many voters, and emphasized instead his rise from poverty, his inspiring rags-to-riches story, a tip of what they used to call a log cabin and hard cider campaign, except he didn't drink hard cider. <laughs> so it was all about his origins, all about 
chopping wood and splitting rails and being a farm boy and a flatboatman. And that carried the day. Certainly not his appearance and certainly not, yeah. not it, campaigning. Was, was he wealthy eventually? Ever? Really? He, well, you know, it cost about $100 a year to send his son to Harvard. So there's, you know, it mm, wasn't terribly taxing. He got $25,000 a year as president. When he died intestate, which is astonishing for a brilliant lawyer, mm. he left about $105,000. So he didn't, he wasn't a big sport, you know. Yeah. He had great housing. He rented his house in Illinois. Right. Harvard but, was cheap. But when he lived cheap. in Illinois, did he make a lot of money from he his law practice? He had a few practice? really good cases. He had a $5,000 case once. Mm -hmm. He had a couple of big cases. But he made, you know, mm -hmm. as my mother would say, he made a living. But <laughs> he lived in a nice house. Yeah. He certainly wasn't the wealthiest lawyer in Illinois right. or in the country by far. But one of the reasons he didn't have a more successful law practice is he liked the life of riding the judicial circuit. So it took him, and then also going to Chicago or other cities, because every time he went out on a case, he stayed an extra day or two to massage his political allies. And meet the visit newspapers. The news Absolutely. <laughs> he went to newspaper editors. You know, some of them said, oh, I'm busy with the setting type, and I don't want to really come down. But they would come down, and they would be mesmerized by, by this Isn't guy. Isn't that interesting? Because he knew the voting patterns. And yeah. so I noticed was, that in the So he was a master strategist. He was a strategist, but he was also a statistics guy. Uh -huh. So he would visit the newspaper man and said, you know, I noticed that in that uh, as a legislative district, we would call it an assembly district, the vote went up about 100 between the last two elections for our party. So I think in 1860, in the presidential race, it's really likely we can flip this district. And the people would look at him and say, how on earth does he know that? And because he did. He loved election tables, his, so his contemporaries interesting. said. And he owned a newspaper. Secretly. Explain that newspaper. Why? Well, he found <laughs> a German newspaper. Well, Germans were immigrating in huge numbers to the West, from Germany to the East mm -hmm. and then to the West. And they were largely Republican and liberal. They were refugees from the rev rev failed revolutions in Europe in 1848. So, settling here, they were naturally anti slavery, pro infrastructure improvements, just like Lincoln. And he courted them and believed that so many Germans were moving into Indiana and Illinois that those states might flip from Democratic to Republican in the presidential race. So they're starting their own newspapers. And here comes a guy to his hometown of Springfield whose newspaper has just been closed down, his printing press taken into hock, into receivership, because he ran out of money. He turned to Lincoln and said, will you lend me $500 so I can get my printing press out of hock? Lincoln said, no, but I'll invest $500, and I will have you sign a contract. We have the contracts, his contract and the publishers. All he asked for was that they not stray from Republican platform philosophy for the next year, up until the end of the election. This is 1859. And at the end of a year, the editor could keep the press and have everything. He wouldn't take any, Lincoln didn't want any money. He just wanted loyalty and support. And we know they supported the heck out of him because the English language newspapers reported so. Um, How hard was it to become a citizen to be able to vote? Five years in vote. No walls. Lincoln was pr very pro-immigration and um, less excited about Irish immigration because they tended to vote Democratic, <laughs> but certainly was happy about Irish immigration during the Civil War because mm -hmm. immigrants replenished the enormous casualty mm. rates, and they replenished the army and navy. He was always pro-immigration, even in a period when xenophobia was at its worst in this country. Interesting. So I'm sure people ask you that today. What would he think about the Republican Party and the candidates? Well, I think he would not recognize the party. Um, it's anti-immigrant. It's anti-investment in infrastructure. It's uh, uh, it's for limiting voting rights, where, where Lincoln was actually killed for suggesting that we expand voting rights to African Americans. John Wilkes Booth was mm -hmm. in the audience. Um, but I think he would recognize the kind of fray that they're in. I mean, people often say to me, Lincoln would be disgusted by the kind of campaigns we run today. That he wouldn't be disgusted with. He would think it's a lot of fun that Trump is you know, <laughs> waging the kind of campaign they waged in the 19th century. Because if you read 
the transcripts of the Lincoln-Douglas debates, which have this elevated reputation as being the height of political discourse in this country, there are insults and uh, making, they make fun of each other, and uh, it's really rough stuff. And um, that's what we have back today, at least on the Republican side. Who spun it that, they, that it was so elevated, the debate? How did that happen? You know, it's, Lincoln had the book published, and when visitors came to him during the campaign and said, will you tell us again about your slavery position, he would give them the book and say, this is, it's all in the book. And he had hundreds of them and gave them away, which is why we have so many with his, with his signature on them. <laughs> but um, he didn't, um, he, he, he thought they were elevated in a way that they just represented his position between all of, and all the lines of personal animus and teasing and joking. Um, I think in the 20th century, when our debates began to be, uh, after the Kennedy debates, when they began to be less elevated, remember Admiral Stockdale and his famous who am I, why am I here yeah. debate uh, as a vice presidential <laughs> candidate said, why can't we go back to the Lincoln-Douglas debates? Uh, and Mario Cuomo, rest his soul, who was a real Lincoln student, Lincoln scholar, thought that the Lincoln-Douglas debates should be replicated. But I think he meant, in terms of, let's have everybody do three hours at a time, and may the man who doesn't fall over be crowned the winner. Right. In substance, they weren't great. They were repetitive yeah. and, and filled with, with personal animus. Why, didn't, why did Mario, why was he a Lincoln scholar? What was it about Lincoln that attracted him? Well, you know, it's, uh, it always starts, or it seems very often to start, with some unforeseen personal epiphany. And with Mario, his sister, Marie, gave him a history book club edition of the collected works of Abraham Lincoln when he was a law student, I think, and eight volumes. And unlike most Lincoln scholars who dip into it and use the index, Mario read it from cover to cover to cover to cover to cover, all eight volumes, <laughs> and found in it the, the thing that represented his philosophy, Lincoln's fragment on government. The legitimate object of government is to do all for a people which they cannot do for themselves. He called it progressive pragmatism or pragmatic progressivism, but he found it. So that's the concept three. of a large government. A large enough government. Large Never enough. admitted to a large government philosophy, large enough government oh. to do what people can't do for themselves. And so that's how it started with him, his sister. And the books. Isn't that interesting. Yeah. You know, when you were talking about your teacher, and my eight, my eighth grade teacher, uh, civics teacher, was the reason, well, actually seventh grade, that I was interested in politics, and then I met Eleanor Roosevelt. Herbert Eben he was a remarkable teacher, I, and that's the kind of thing that teachers should be more respected for what they do to people. You know, I but I think in a way, I still hear stories from our students. We have honors students, and you have to test to get into our programs. And the hunter population of students is so extraordinary, it is. so diverse, representing countries throughout the world and representing the whole tapestry of New York's population. And, and the age also. Yeah. Oh, there are a lot of right. older students. They, they sometimes don't graduate in four years because mm -hmm. they're working really hard to help support their own families. But they're so smart about the world, and there's such energy there. And they know this country. They know the world. And... Um, they're inspired too, and, and they're inspiring. Mm. So they come to a special program? They do. A, they have, and they get credit? They get credit. They get um, the chance to hear great lecturers. They get first dibs on our public programs if they, if they can stay uh, in the evening. They get wonderful student programs uh, at lunchtime on issues of the day. And we have a special focus this year in our uh, lecture, in our public lecture series called Campaign 2016. It's obvious, but I think it's necessary. And one of the, we have uh, Michael Waldman speaking on his new book, The Fight to Vote. We have uh, Annette Gordon-Reed speaking about her Jefferson book and about his mm -hmm. views on voting. Um, I'm gonna talk about my new book called A Just and Generous Nation. I wrote Sorry. it with an economist named Norton Garfinkel. Mm -hmm. And it's about Lincoln's economic right. philosophy. We're talking to Ron Chernow about the Hamilton phenomenon in history and in theater. And, but we have lots of political figures coming in. We have um, uh, women's reproductive rights as an issue. We have environmental issues. So, and, and one of the things we hope to do is not only encourage students to hear 
and see, but we're going to try to do voter registration at Hunter Great. to, to um, put our money where our mouth is and Great. participate. And your, the lectures for the public are free. They're free. And they're all listed. You have a wonderful website. It's called... It's called uh, Roosevelt. Roosevelt House. Just do Roosevelt. Just, nobody does websites. I mean, they just Google Roosevelt yeah, House. Roosevelt and House. Um, uh, you can sign on and be on our regular mailing list and get invited to and all of our lectures, all of our programs. Of course, we have our bit of, of Roosevelt history and World War II things and New Deal things that we put in as well. So it's a very, it's a varied program, and it's a, a few nights every every single week. It's very busy. Yeah. And so is Harold Holtz. Are very busy. So people should really, if they look at, if they just Google you, they will get a very extensive background of which I haven't been able to even delve into really in a main way. <laughs> I'm glad we got to talk about our belly years, though. <laughs> that, was, that was amazing. That it was, was the best years. It gave us a very good foundation, didn't it? It did. Are you another person who's done all these exciting things and still that was the best years? Absolutely. Isn't that interesting? We'll have to do another program about that. Thank you, Harold Holzer. Thanks, Thank honey. you so much. If there are any people you'd like to hear or topics you'd like us to explore, please let me know. You can write to me at CUNY TV, 365 Fifth Avenue, New York, New York, 10016. Or you can go to the website at cuny.tv and click on Contact Us. I look forward to hearing from you. Thank you.